Today's episode is in part brought to you by Skillshare. Last week, I did manage to get my hands on a copy of a 1922 Shakespeare and Company edition, which is, if you know, the history of Ulysses, the first edition published by Sylvia Beach in Paris. The copy was housed downstairs or in the archives at the State Library of Victoria, which actually required a special consultation with a librarian to get my hands on. But nevertheless, I did manage to touch it uh, without gloves and had a look at James Joyce's signature. As I was looking at the copy, I just realized there's so many intricate details and so many intricate stories within each and every one of these details so today we are going to take a very archival research kind of approach to exploring Ulysses and of course I'm going to supplement you with some resources and recommendations on the lines of which edition should you buy or which version is the best one to read and all of that if you stick around for the rest of today's video we are going to cover all of them in Hopefully not so long of a video, but before I get to the meat of today's content, today's episode was kindly sponsored by today's video partner, Skillshare. So in short, Skillshare is the largest online learning platform featuring classes from all spheres of creative pursuits, including design, music, film, photography, and if you really, really want to do it, uh, there might be a gardening course on there somewhere, and I know I kept talking about gardening. And during those hours when I'm not fantasizing about becoming a gardener, I am in fact taking one of Skillshare's new learning paths, which is one of their new features. If you're new to Skillshare and you don't exactly know where to start your journey, the learning paths are super great because they actually streamline and curate courses for you to master a specific skill. And since I've been writing a lot of stuff, uh, especially on Substack nowadays, I've been taking a lot of their essay writing classes from the hobbyists uh, learning path under the title creative essay writing explore the personal and powerful but it just happened to be the case that writing is my jam and you your jam might be acrylic painting it might be sewing so you can go down many a rabbit holes including exploring acrylic painting as an absolute beginner to take your knitting to the next level all the way to learn how to sew all the skills you need to make your own clothing so if you want to invest in yourself in 2024 and if you want to advance your skill sets, head over to my link in the description down below and the first 500 people to visit my link will get a one month free trial for Skillshare. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring today's video and now let's move on to our beloved book Ulysses. So let us begin this meandering love letter to one of my favorite books of all time with a discussion on the various editions of Ulysses that are kind of going around the book market. And a lot of people naively assume that, well, Penguin Random House published it. That must be the definitive edition, right? But nothing can be further from the truth. But first of all, a little bit of the history about the text. So the 1922 edition that I had a look at in the archive, and of course, this is a replica of that exact copy. It's actually, in fact, probably the most messed up edition of all editions of Ulysses. The book was set to publish on the 2nd of February, 1922. So I know that's a lot of twos. And the story was James Joyce made friends with this lovely lady who had a bookshop at the time called Shakespeare and Company and decided to compile all the preceding episodes, which were previously published in magazines as a serialized novel into a complete book. But despite how lengthy the eventual manuscript was when Joyce submitted his manuscript for publication at Shakespeare and Company, the last two episodes of the book were still incomplete. Any one of these horror tales of missing a deadline par excellence, James Joyce actually got his proof copies back from the printer. This is the printer we're talking about. It's not even his editor from the printer and decided to write basically two thirds of the last two episodes of Ulysses in the margins of the proof. According to the scholar Richard Mattis' research, Research, Joyce added 9,380 words or 42% of the episode after making a fair copy of the manuscript. And you can probably imagine the amount of errors contained within these marginal notes that he happened to scribble down. And do keep in mind, the book was originally printed in Dijon, France, as this note had it. And most, if not all, the printers did not speak much English. And imagine trying to typeset one of these real complicated pieces of English literature in a French press. And as the story had it, they actually ran out of certain letters that weren't frequently used in French. So on some of the pages, these words could look really weird in a 1922 edition. So at the end of the day, we ended up with this Frankenstein of an edition full of errors. And the edition had to include one of these real apologetic notes. The publisher asks the reader's indulgence for typographical errors on a voice 
unavoidable in the exceptional circumstances. Three years later, Sylvia Beach, who ran the bookshop, hired someone to basically work on a corrected edition of Ulysses. And the story went, she hired someone from Daily Mail at the time, which was a much bigger deal than Daily Mail nowadays. And this well-intentioned proofreader went through the book and ended up correcting a bunch of things that should have not been corrected, because sometimes James Joyce wasn't like other boys. He liked to leave intentional mistakes as stylistic choices in the book. So that made the act of correcting the book incredibly difficult. And basically all the subsequent editions, ranging from the Boldly Head edition, all the way to the Penguin Random House edition, all suffered this basic curse of correcting things that shouldn't be corrected and not correcting things that should have been corrected. So in the end, we don't really know what the final edition of Ulysses really is. Until the year 1984, where a definitive edition or a synoptic edition came out, corrected and edited by Hans Walter Gabler. In short, Gabler's goal was to reconstruct an edition of Ulysses that is basically definitive, scholarly, and intended for academic research. And he did so by sifting through various editions of Ulysses, various typescripts, manuscripts, and letters by James Joyce to reconstruct his original voice. And yes, despite yet another huge volume of academic squabbles and uh, technical hair splitting, uh, in my opinion, this might be the closest thing that we have to the original Ulysses. And especially for Joycean scholars, this is viewed as kind of like the folio edition of Shakespeare. If you want to study Shakespeare, uh, the Gabler's edition is typically used in universities to study James Joyce's Ulysses. And after that long digression into a kind of archival slash historical dive into the history of Ulysses, which edition should you buy? In my opinion, if you're just reading Ulysses for fun, the Gabler edition is probably one of the more comprehensive ones that you can read or should read. But then again, the Baldly Head edition and the Random House edition, they're both adequate with uh, some number of weird idiosyncrasies within them, but they're still adequate to read if you just want to experience the text for the first time. But if you're intellectually adventurous and you want to challenge yourself, I highly recommend the Cambridge Centenary Edition of Ulysses. I actually have the book right here in the video background. It is a very, very big book, but I think it's uh, it's big for a good reason. There are introductory essays that you can read to each episode of Ulysses that you can read to deepen your understanding. And on top of that, this book is filled with annotations. So if you want to trace down certain allusions within the text, uh, that's also a really good addition for you to have. So, so far we spent basically a ridiculous amount of time doing archival work. And we're not out of the woods just yet because there's more archival work to do. If you know the book Ulysses in any shape or form, you're probably also aware of the fact that nothing much really happens in a book. It's basically a story that spans over the course of one entire day on the 16th of June 1904 in Dublin. And this entire day was split up into 18 chapters, all featuring Homeric episodic headings. And a general idea here is that this Ulysses book it basically parallels Homer's Odyssey. But because James Joyce is James Joyce, he didn't even bother to put the chapter headings or episodic headings on any of the episodes. So for the readers of the original 1922 edition, uh, they're basically reading this 700-paged mammoth of a thing with no chapter breaks or with very, very little chapter breaks. But in certain editions of Ulysses, you can probably find these really elaborate looking schemata or these tables that explain what the chapter's about or the timestamp of the chapter. And these tables are the famous Lenati and Gilbert schemata for James Joyce's Ulysses. And the story was that as he was writing the book, a friend of his wants him to explain what, what the book is about. And he had to basically come up with a schema to explain what the book was about. And that table ended up eventually being the Lenati Ulysses schema. And about a year later, after the Lenati schema, James Joyce's friend, Valérie Laboud, was giving a lecture on Ulysses. And he too wanted another table or another schema to go with his lecture. And hence, we ended up with the second schema, also called the Gilbert schema, because this table was eventually published by Stuart Gilbert in a subsequent edition. The two schemata basically provided each episode with their Homeric names and parallels, alongside timestamps for the day of 16th of June 1904. So think of it as one of those maps that you buy for $2 at the entrance gate of a national park so you don't get lost in the park. But sometimes do keep in mind, the map is not usually the territory. And this is also the case with the schemata. If you head into each episode and anticipating these symbols or anticipating these parallels, that's basically gonna take a lot out of your reading experience. Because even though Ulysses is one of these giant and encyclopedic masterpieces, it is also a book that you should enjoy, first and foremost, before you go and hunt down some of these obscure references.
preferences. And speaking of enjoying Ulysses without letting the illusions or the complexity get in the way, I know just the right person for us to get our foot in the door with reading Ulysses. And to do just that, I paid a visit to my campus at the University of Melbourne. And this is Professor Ronan McDonald, the Chair Higgins Chair of Irish Studies. About a month ago, I studied an intensive Ulysses course with Professor Ronan McDonald. And in this brief interview, I asked him for some tips and some advice on how to read Ulysses and how to get the most out of it. There's so many things that Ulysses gives. On the most obvious level, it gives us the sense of intimate acquaintance with uh, a mind thinking, or more than one mind thinking, but that following of consciousness, how it works, provides us with an intimacy that we've had in literature before. A lot of people approach Ulysses with that sense that they need to illuminate everything, understand everything, to annotate every illusion. Uh, I think it's a mistake to approach Ulysses thinking, oh, there's something wrong with me if I don't know what's going on, or if I can't uh, understand all those illusions straight away. The first time I read Ulysses, I was, I was um, uh, probably a bit lost. Still am, really. You know, you, you, you never get totally unlost. The first readers of Ulysses, those reading it in Paris in 1922, did not understand all the illusions, or not get all the illusions or references to Irish politics or Irish social life or the, the individuals in Dublin. Uh, and the individuals in Dublin, whoever, whenever they got to read it, didn't uh, surely get all the allusions to uh, the Parisian streets. So nobody reads Ulysses and gets it all. Oh, everyone is reading it from the perspective of their own experience and everyone is reading it in the half-light. So the secret of reading Ulysses, I think, is not to try to um, get it all, not to try and annotate it all. I think that it is um, better to resist that temptation, to unclench and relax and allow it to flow over you, particularly for a first reading. Be content, just a very practical advice, be content to let pages uh, or illusions slip past you. And, and realise that it's a very funny book. I think that's wonderful. In fact, Joyce himself said that. It, it, it bemused him that people didn't quite get how funny it is uh, and irreverent, even or especially when it's seeming most elusive and canonical and modernist. It's a very irreverent, full of parody, full of imitation of literary styles and indeed individuals. So I think it's a, it, if, when one unclenches, are content to not to follow everything down, you get that humour more too. Thank you, Professor MacDonald. And that brings us to the very end of today's exploration into the textuality of Ulysses. And instead of taking up more of your time in today's video, I will link you to a more extended recommendation page or recommended resources page for you to begin your own Ulysses journey because it is a great book and I personally really like the book and I think I'll keep rereading the book till the day I die. During your first reading, you'll probably find yourself confused, frustrated, and terrified of the entire concept of the book. So I've recommended some podcasts for you to listen to. I've recommended certain online resources for you to navigate through the text more easily. And you can access all of that in the description down below. Happy reading, and I hope that you've enjoyed today's extended exploration of this really terrifying book. And Robin Walden here, hope you're doing well, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care and goodbye.